Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning to you all. I'm delighted to be on board. Uh, uh, thank you for the invi invitation. Uh, let me also congratulate the ICRIA for uh, organizing this conference uh, as part of the East Asia uh, program uh, in its uh, inaugural. Uh, for several reasons. Um, uh, number one, um, China had organized uh, the 70th anniversary of the anti-Japanese war, uh, the VJ Day, as they call, um, in on September 3rd this year. And uh, the Beijing parade was uh, a spectacular event. Although there were no major political statements regarding Japan, but the script uh, appeared to be uh, uh, included um, in terms of the Japanese uh, factor in the last 70 years. Um, I, I gather that the Taiwanese Defense Ministry also organized um, recently a discussion on the anti-Japanese uh, uh, activity uh, in, um, in the 1930s and 1940s. Uh, the, uh, the role of, the, of, the, of Japan in the 1930s and 40s has been a uh, huge debate in the East Asian uh, situation. We have also seen the emperor making a statement on the 14th uh, August, uh, followed by uh, the Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's uh, statement regarding uh, the um, uh, routine statements issued uh, over a long period of time, but uh, this was slightly different uh, in terms of the, uh, the uh, that this generation need not uh, necessarily uh, uh, be considered about the 1940s events and so on and so forth. Uh, ICRIAR's program today is uh, kind of different from what uh, the others have uh, organized, uh, the Chinese, the, the Taiwanese, um, and the Japanese. Um, I think uh, the program uh, that you have in front of you uh, indicates to a realistic assessment of these 70 years of uh, uh, transformation in the Asia-Pacific region. Um, the transformation is primarily, uh, uh, not uh, exclusively, of course, led by uh, Japan in post-war, uh, you know, reconstruction. Uh, if you look at the ASEAN, if you look at the uh, uh, East Asian uh, GDP growth rates, uh, and so on and so forth, there is a huge ODA uh, impact on. Uh, so I think from the point of view of the ICRIA, I think there is uh, a, a major uh, kind of rethinking on this. while. The Beijing parade, uh, the uh, Taiwanese debates, and the Japanese, uh, and the Korean debates have uh, tried to revive the Japanese role of 1930s and 40s. Uh, I think the program here is uh, slightly different, which is to evaluate um, uh, and see what are the opportunities for uh, the Asia-Pacific region as a whole. Um, so from this point of view, I let me congratulate the ICRIAR for a um, path-breaking kind of uh, initiative. Um, I was asked to speak on the territorial disputes in the Asia-Pacific with focus on the Senkaku Islands with the uh, South China Sea and the India-China border areas, uh, the three, uh, which are uh, of uh, quite significance, uh, strategic significance, uh, partly because territorial disputes keep dragging the diplomatic energies, the military energies, uh, nationalism, which uh, sometimes constrains the uh, relations between A and B uh, in the international system. Uh, to that extent, I think the territorial disputes issue is a, a major topic that uh, we need to revisit again uh, and see what is the impact uh, in the last seven decades of this. Uh, of course, we have seen that from 1945 uh, everyone entered into the Westphalian phase, Westphalian order. Uh, the Westphalian order in 1648 suggested to the latitudes and longitudes, uh, trying to find the identities of countries in terms of internal sovereignty and external sovereignty. Um, of course, today, uh, uh, with the globalization, with the ICT, information and communication technologies, uh, and uh, as uh, Brezhensky mentioned, uh, in terms of the events in Syria, Libya, uh, Egypt, and others, uh, the borders are withering away um, in terms of these bombings periodically by the French, by the Americans, by the Russians, and possibly in future by the Chinese. Uh, a couple of days ago, uh, a Chinese was killed as well in this region, and uh, uh, 
Uh, in Africa, there were uh, about three uh, Chinese railway employees, uh, topmost employees were also killed in these uh, events. So in other words, the withering away of the borders will also bring in the state action in several of these places. Um, so we are seeing uh, a contradictory kind of a situation. One emphasis on the Westphalian order in terms of protection of those sovereignties, uh, like on the Senkaku Islands, like in the South China Sea, like in the uh, line of actual control between India and China. On the other hand, we have also been seeing, uh, witnessing the uh, spread of globalization, the spread of uh, terrorism, which have in a way uh, removed those borders and uh, with the non-traditional security issues of migration of uh, various others, we have seen those borders withering away. So these two contradictory themes uh, uh, have come about in the last seven decades of the Asia-Pacific uh, region uh, and with the rest of the world, but we are focusing on this region. Um, uh, this topic is also important because the, uh, the, the, uh, both the Japanese, Chinese, and Indians uh, and Koreans are involved today extensively in debating about what should be the course of action uh, to resolve some of the territorial disputes. Uh, for example, the Senkaku Islands were under the physical control of Japan after the Treaty of Shimonoski was signed uh, when China was defeated by Japan. So from 19th century onwards, Japan has been in physical control. And prior to the Second World War, the, uh, the, some of the uh, enterprising uh, Japanese businessmen have set up shop in uh, some of these islands to produce uh, azimuth uh, and other items which are used in fashion designs uh, and so on and so forth from the Senkaku Islands. So the Japanese argument essentially is that they are in physical control of these islands. Of course, in the last few years, from 2010, we have seen the Chinese nationalism clashing with the Japanese nationalism. Uh, we have also seen the debates within Japan, the Japanese mayor, uh, the Tokyo mayor, um, trying to nationalize some of these islands, and then the whole central government uh, had nationalized these islands. So we have seen the debates uh, within China and Japan uh, coinciding in terms of nationalism. That is a major. But as a as a as a product byproduct of this, we have seen the Japanese self-defense uh, maritime forces, as well as the Chinese uh, Navy and the Coast Guard, and the uh, Chinese Air Force have been in frequent um, uh, transgressions uh, in this area. The Japanese Self-Defense Maritime Forces came out with a white report, white paper, uh, which suggested that last year there were about 464 times uh, of transgressions in the uh, Senkaku Islands by the Chinese. We do not know how many that the Japanese uh, have countered uh, in terms of a physical uh, you know, blockade of the uh, Jap uh, Chinese uh, Coast Guard and so on, but this suggests that there is a possibility of uh, uh, conflict, conflict going out of hands and possibly uh, to a physical war between the two sides. Uh, so the transgressions have been one factor which had led to uh, some concerns in this region. But remember in 1970s, Tang Xiaoping uh, told the Japanese Prime Minister, let us postpone this dispute. Uh, he suggested let us uh, mutually exploit the resources. Uh, in fact, the Japanese and the Chinese have also discussed about how to exploit the energy resources uh, and have identified specific zones where they can exploit the energy resources in Chunxiao Islands and in the, uh, in the exclusive economic zones that each of, the, each of these countries claim. In fact, there are a series of discussions uh, formally between Japan and China in order to exploit this, although there are some concerns as well that the uh, Chinese have been drilling in those areas where the Japanese have claimed as part of their EEZs. Uh, so uh, it is uh, also, uh, the territorial disputes also have implications for the energy uh, related resources in addition to nationalism, in addition to the Westphalian world order. Um, the other factor that has brought in uh, is the US role uh, in all the territorial disputes as well as in the Senkaku Islands as well. Uh, for instance, President Obama gave in writing to the Yomi Shimbun uh, that the Senkaku Islands indeed are part of the alliance between US and Japan. 
uh, which suggests that there is uh, a, uh, a larger role that possibly uh, that this, this dispute can uh, reflect to, this dispute can spill over. Um, we, we saw during the end of the Korean War uh, in the 1950s, um, General MacArthur suggested we will, not, we will never involve in any territorial disputes uh, in the Asian region, Asia-Pacific region in 1950-51 when the Korean War ended in a stalemate. Um, but we do see that the U.S. has now become a factor with these alliances uh, uh, also spilling over into the territorial disputes. Um, so there is the U.S. factor which is becoming quite obvious in the uh, territorial disputes. The second South China Sea has, been, has also been alluded to by uh, Ambassador H.K. Singh. Um, South China Sea is the current hot topic. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, a couple of days ago, the United States had flown the B-52 bombers in this region uh, and is now planning to have two more missions in, in addition to the USS Lassen uh, about a couple of weeks ago. Uh, in addition to this, the freedom of navigation operations uh, United States is, con is trying to conduct in the region. The Senkaku, the S South China Sea Islands, again, are also part of what the Chinese say uh, as a historical kind of uh, 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 legacy and a historical kind of uh, backup in terms of the uh, sovereignty claims, which is generally not recognized under the international law. Uh, international law suggests to the physical and continuous occupation rather than uh, be, these being discovered in Ming Dynasty or in other periods. Uh, so historical claims generally have very less uh, credence in any sovereignty dispute. Uh, nevertheless, uh, China had uh, sent a draft to the U United Nations Secretary General last May suggesting that the nine-dashed line is what Chinese believe as the sovereign area for the South China Sea. In other words, China had put up a draft to the United Nations, but not to the General Assembly, not to the International Court of Justice, not to the uh, Arbitration Tribunal, but to the Secretary General uh, to suggest that these nine dashed line, which includes about 80% of uh, the South China Sea areas as part of the Chinese claimed region. Now, uh, unlike on the Senkaku Islands, we have seen substantial military preparation in the South China Sea. 1974, 1988, in the Paracels and the Mischief Reef in 88. Uh, subsequently, we have seen also recently that uh, the Chinese have reclaimed land in the South China Sea with about six reefs converted into islands with dredging projects and so on and so forth. Um, uh, when we were studying in China, the one of the first lessons we had was Yukung Yishan, uh, a foolish old man who moved the mountains. That was when we were studying Chinese language uh, that was one of the uh, lessons we had. Uh, Yukung Yishan in incidentally means how to dominate, how to dominate the nature, how to uh, uh, exert oneself in terms of uh, removing the mountains for one's own comfort, comfort levels. Uh, I think China is doing the Yukung Yishan in South China Sea by completely uh, building up islands uh, over reefs which are generally, um, generally uh, drowned in terms of high tide. Um, so so there's a lot be, there has uh, a lot of exertion by the Chinese state in terms of the South China Sea uh, islands. Now, um, one of the ways of resolving the South China Sea is, uh, uh, has been the, uh, the UNCLOS uh, provisions, the United Nations Law of the Sea Convention, uh, which suggests to mainly two aspects uh, in terms of sovereignty. One is uh, measuring the, uh, the, uh, the disputed areas from the continental shelf. Uh, secondly, in terms of uh, measuring the uh, disputed areas from the islands uh, as the basis. Now, since the Chinese have been building these islands or reconstructing these islands or putting up completely different islands, uh, the exclusive economic zone will be extended from these islands into over 200 nautical miles, rather than from the continental shelf from uh, China. But China has uh, a contradictory uh, kind of interpretation of the UNCLOS. When it comes to the Yellow Sea, China suggests to the continental shelf. But when it comes to the South China Sea, China suggests to measuring from the island or from the reefs, which China claims, which 
provides it more than a, a thousand to twelve hundred nautical mile from the Chinese coast. So, in other words, this has now become very controversial, and the Filipinos have gone to the arbitration tribunal. Uh, and uh, uh, incidentally, over a couple of weeks ago, the Chinese foreign ministry, after the tribunal suggested that this issue is now uh, open for uh, um, um, legal arbitration uh, on seven claims on South uh, Asia Pacific region becoming a, a problematic area, especially because uh, over $5.5 trillion worth of goods and services pass through this region. Uh, so it has international commerce uh, and uh, um, uh, series of communications um, uh, coming under the purview of the South China Sea, including India, where 55% of Indian trade passes through the South China Sea. In other words, India then becomes a part of the uh, dispute, uh, not necessarily in terms of the sovereignty dispute, but in terms of how the dispute is resolved in this region. Uh, the third aspect that I was asked to speak is on the India-China border areas. As you all know, this has not been uh, defined. This has not been um, accepted uh, by both the parties, the line of actual control. There have been uh, eight talks, three talks between uh, China and India in uh, 1960, and uh, about eight talks between 81 to 87, and then again about 15 talks under the joint work group uh, framework, and now in the 18 special representative meetings, these have been discussed. In other words, uh, the India-China border dispute has been discussed for nearly 34 years now, uh, and still it is not yet uh, defined, the dispute is not yet defined, nor a solution has been offered to. But what we have seen in the recent times is also some of the spectacular transgressions that have happened on the India-China line of actual control areas. Um, while I mentioned to you before, uh, while there were about 400 odd transgressions on the Senkaku Islands, uh, we have seen that there has been about 340, 350 transgressions on the line of actual control between India and China. Uh, on an average, uh, 300 to 350 and sometimes 400 uh, transgressions happen on the India-China border areas. So in other words, these, both these disputes are uh, active. Uh, uh, on Senkaku as well as the, uh, the India-China border areas. Uh, likewise, as Tang Xiaoping told the Japanese Prime Minister, let us postpone the dispute. Likewise, there is also the, the, the offer by the, to the Indian side when Rajiv Gandhi visited China that let us postpone the dispute and let us look at uh, opportunities in the bilateral field. So both these disputes have some commonalities in terms of the Chinese posture on, um, on, on uh, looking at the other bilateral uh, issues. Um, what are the solutions offered for all these disputes, Senkaku, South China Sea, and uh, India-China border areas? The Chinese offer was uh, mainly political in nature, uh, not necessarily legal in nature. Although China s sticks to the Westphalian order, uh, uh, once in a while it does suggest, like the Indians, uh, that it is a civilizational state not a Westphalian state, yet it says it abides by the UN Charter, United Nations Charter. Um, what we have seen is um, China had proposed in most of these uh, either a mutual accommodation principle uh, or a mutual understanding principle or a mutual benefit principle um, uh, for resolving the territorial disputes in, in uh, the borders with uh, China, the 14 land neighbors, as well as the five maritime neighbors of China. Um, but however, we have not seen much progress in relation to uh, the mutual benefit principle uh, in South China Sea or in the Senkaku Islands. Uh, this has not been proposed for the India-China borders. Uh, what has been proposed for the India-China borders is mutual accommodation and mutual understanding, which basically are political in nature and uh, uh, a deal that has been proposed to the Indian side which has not been acceptable to the Indian side. Uh, how this di these disputes can be resolved? Uh, as the Filipinos took the lead, uh, one is the international arbitration. Uh, however, in the joint statements that China had with the Japanese, with the, uh, many of the Southeast Asian uh, countries with which they have dispute in the South China Sea Islands, as well as with India, in the joint statements, uh, for instance, with PV Narsimha Rao, 
the joint statement suggested in 1993 to peaceful resolution of the dispute and through negotiations and through talks, which means that uh, India cannot go to the International Court of Justice or Japan cannot go to the International Court of Justice uh, or uh, any of these cannot resolve the dispute through a, a, a non-peaceful means, uh, meaning uh, through various other means of non-peaceful war or other domination, strategic domination or other means. So in other words, there has been a constraining uh, effect in terms of the solution. Um, uh, so we have now entered into a lot of diplomatic, military, uh, and political uh, kind of discussion on these three disputes vis-a-vis -vis the, the partners. Uh, one of the principles, as I mentioned, was the uh, postponing the dispute for joint development. This has been proposed to the Senkaku Islands. This has been proposed to the South China Sea. Uh, of course, this has not been proposed to the India-China border areas. However, we have not seen any uh, joint development projects uh, between, say, China and Japan or between Southeast Asian countries and China uh, in the South China Sea dispute. Uh, for instance, most of the oil drilling platforms are kind of unilateral rather than joint development for exploitation of the energy resources. So, so uh, we, can, we can interpret then the, then the postponing the dispute or joint development mainly to buy time to possibly also dominate uh, the, the region for advantage. Uh, for any advantageous position. Um, to conclude, I would suggest that the uh, Asia-Pacific region had gone through a huge transformation uh, economically uh, and uh, uh, integration aspects uh, as part of the globalization, as the previous two uh, speakers have mentioned. Um, uh, also, there is uh, the territorial disputes have led to uh, huge uh, expenditures uh, on Japan, China, South China, Southeast Asian countries, India, and so on and so forth. We have spent huge energies on this uh, at the diplomatic level, at the uh, military level, um, uh, and so on and so forth. Yet, we have not seen uh, anyone crossing the line uh, except in 1962, um, because 1962 has been identified in the official Chinese literature as uh, the main reason for entering into a, a border skirmish. Uh, overall, then, we can say that, uh, that these disputes have not been leading to uh, an explicit conflict. Uh, today, of course, uh, 2015 is not 1962. There has been major developments in terms of various, uh, various uh, uh, economic, military, and so on factors. Um, what we can suggest in these 70 years has been, especially in the latest period, the conflict has become more limited in nature. Although everybody is spending a lot of money in terms of the defense budgets and so on, Japan, India, China, uh, most of the Southeast Asian countries in terms of new acquisitions and what is called as spirals of security, uh, security dilemmas. Yet we have seen the conflict is limited in nature and mostly at the diplomatic level uh, and semi-diplomatic level, meaning uh, also at the political and the military level. Um, uh, uh, so that is good news uh, overall, that the, that, that the territorial disputes have not been uh, uh, come to the fore to, to uh, lead to a, a warlike situation, although we have had some instances uh, in the Senkaku Islands or in Daulat Bay Goldi areas or in South China Sea, yet we have seen uh, most of the parties climbing down uh, in the final analysis. So this is one uh, major prospect for the Asia-Pacific. Uh, let me then congratulate the ICRIER for conducting such studies uh, in, uh, which are different from what, uh, what have been there in China or in Taiwan or in Japan. Uh, thank you.